another world music vlog coming to you from London, the second story of the double decker bus. And uh, it's kind of noisy up here, so I'm going to switch to a different location. Okay, this is better. Excuse me, let me just get a uh, sip of tea. Oh, very nice. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about chapter 9 because there's some information that you're responsible for that's actually not covered in the textbook. So if you get out the PDF lecture for chapter 9 and open that up, um, when you get to the part that talks about Cuban rumba, Cuba, obviously an island in the Caribbean, not um, a country in South America, but a lot of these different uh, places that I've, um, that I've highlighted for you have kind of the same origins in their music. Um, so Cuban music is organized, or at least the rhythms are organized by something which is called the clave. And clave is both an instrument and a rhythm. And the rhythm sounds like this. And that pattern has direction to it, meaning that you can either play it 3-2, which is the way I just played it, or you can flip it around and play it 2-3. 1-2, or 1-2-3. And the direction of the clave also influences the direction of all the other parts that are played in Cuban music. So when you see in the notes it talks about direction, it's talking about the rhythmic direction and how all the music is really organized around the instrument and the pattern which we call clave. So it's a really essential key element to the music and without that sort of superimposed rhythm, the music doesn't really work as well. It needs that in order to kind of fit together for all the parts to fit together. Caribbean and Brazilian music combines many of these phrases together, like a rhythmic weave that has been developed and refined by generations of musicians to create beautiful tapestries of sound. This Cuban pattern, played by Michael Spiro, is called timbao. Uh, the next term on the sheet is tumbadoras. That's really the plural term for a collection of drums, which we casually call conga drums from time to time. But there are actually three sizes. And so if you start with the smallest drum, it's called the quinto. The middle sized drum is called the conga. And the largest drum is called the tumba. And all together we call those tumbadoras. And each one of those drums has a part that it plays. So there's an actual rhythmic pattern which is played on the tumba, the largest drum. There's a pattern on the conga. The quinto is really more of a lead drum and it sort of converses with the other two drums. So it's really kind of conversational, it's talking, and even though they do have you know, parts that they play, really the music is much more conversational, meaning that one person might play uh, a little call and then the other drums are expected to respond in the same way that if we were having a conversation, you would have to respond to my question or, or my comment to you. Um, the third term on the guide there is guiro, G-U-I-R-O, guiro, and that's technically any instrument that's made from a gourd. But in the case of uh, Cuban music, the guiro is a gourd that's got slots cut into it or etched into it, and then you play it with a stick. All right, just to blow through this stuff, if we go to Brazil, the next slide, the type of music that we study in Brazil is called samba. And uh, I've got a couple terms at the top there. Samba batucada is a samba pattern that's played only with the drums. Sort of like if you went to a parade and you heard a marching band going down the street. In between playing the songs, they would have the drummers play a cadence just to keep everybody moving. And that's exactly what samba batucada is. It's basically samba with just drums only. The next term is samba enredo, E-N-R-E-D-O, and enredo is a theme song. So every year when these groups uh, compete with each other during the carnival celebration in Brazil, they pick one song, a theme song that they play, and it's kind of their song for their group. And the group we call an escola de samba, which means samba school. I think about this in two ways. You can think of it as a school where people might learn because they do come together and they learn a piece of music. 
But uh, I also think of it in the terms of like school of fish and that you have a really big mass of people all working together, moving in the same direction, um, kind of like a school of fish. And they meet and work towards a common goal of, of creating their escola. And it involves not only drummers and musicians, but also people who make costumes, people who dance, people who make the floats that they push down the street. And they're trying to um, win the competition of having the best group, the most colorful, the best organized, the best dancers. That's, that's what they do during carnival time in Brazil. It's, it's really pretty amazing. A favela is the neighborhood where these people come from. They're typically considered to be the, the sort of uh, poorer areas of, of Rio. They're sort of an unincorporated part of town where they um, make their own housing with whatever materials they can find. And recently, unfortunately, in the news, you probably heard, have heard or maybe you've heard about some of the things that are happening in the favelas. There's a lot of crime there. Uh, as people are kind of sort of struggling to survive. So uh, that's kind of a downside to the, uh, to the favela culture. Fantasia is a costume that they wear, and it can range from these very elaborate constructions with steel cages that you get inside that have fireworks and lights coming out of them, all the way down to practically nothing. <laughs> and if you've seen some videos of uh, samba from Brazil, well, you'll see what I mean. Sergio Mendes is a musician, composer from Brazil. One of my favorite albums of all time, actually, Brasileiro, from Sergio Mendes. Check it out. Real quick, the instruments of the samba, um, batucada. The large bass drum is called a surdu, and they have two or three sizes of these. The really big ones um, play on beats two and four which is kind of different from American popular music where we play the biggest, lowest note on one and three, usually like that. In Brazil, in samba, they put the big note on the two and the four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So the biggest, lowest, heaviest note is on two and four, so it's kind of flip-flopped. A tamborim is a small handheld drum that you play with in this hand and you play with a stick called a baqueta. It's not a tambourine. It has no jingles or bells around it. It's just a small drum about that size that you play with a stick. The pandeiro is, in fact, a tambourine. Um, the only difference is that the jingles cup together this way. On a typical tambourine, the little cymbals around the outside of the drum face away from each other and they ring a long time. With the pandeiro, the jingles face toward each other, and so they have a very short percussive sound. The hepanique is a lead drum that's played by the director, and they use that drum to call the group in and out, to start and to stop, to establish tempo. So it's kind of like a conductor drum for the samba batucada. Agogo is a set of two bells, metal bells, a small and a large. And it's a direct descendant of a West African instrument that we already studied, which is called the gankogui. Last on the list is the gansa, which is a shaker, and uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's a shaker. All right, last area that we will go to that's not talked about in the textbook is Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, they also have a competition during carnival time, but instead of playing samba batucada or samba, they play calypso. And specifically, they play that music on an instrument called a steel pan or a steel drum. So if you look at the first page of the Trinidad notes here, we have uh, Ali Minet as the father or the inventor of the steel pan. And uh, he developed this instrument in the mid 1940s um, as a young person in Trinidad and was the first person to craft <clears throat> an instrument from a 55 gallon, gallon oil, oil barrel. barrel in 1946 when he was just a teenager. The Caribbean steel drum, or steel pan, is one of the world's newest and most unique percussion instruments. Once considered a novelty, they are rapidly expanding in sophistication and in numbers throughout the United States and the world. However, the number of people who can successfully create one of these incredibly complex instruments is very small. Then I've listed the names of the drums. So in the same way that we have instruments in the orchestral family, we also have instruments in the steel pan family, starting with the lead or tenor drum, which is just one drum, a double tenor, 
two drums, double seconds, also two drums, guitar or cello, which is a set of three drums, and then finally the bass with a six bass, which is six full-sized 55-gallon oil barrels completely surrounding the musician. Panorama is the competition that they perform in in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and they have something like 65 bands between the two islands that compete for the title of best, you know, steel band for Panorama. Each group can have from anywhere from 60 to 120. 120 is the limit. Um, and at the center of those bands, with all the steel pans around, they have what's called the engine room. And that's where the percussionist and the drum set player play. And so um, they're kind of centrally located and they play this sort of incessant groove that sounds like an engine, so we call that the engine room. Um, the last thing that I put into the notes was just a little bit about steel pan construction. If I had more time, I'd really give you a more detailed uh, kind of you know insight into that process. But essentially, you take a 55-gallon oil drum, and you can see in the picture in the notes, there's a gentleman right there who's hammering with a, with a sledgehammer to sink the drum into this concave uh, shape. Then after you sink it, you take a hammer and punch and actually groove out where the notes are going to be inside the drum. And then you uh, burn the drum with fire and then hammer from the bottom to create bubbles, which you then tune into notes. So the sequence of events is that you sink it, then you groove it, you put it over a fire and you burn it, and then finally you tune it. And it's a, it's a real art form, tuning a steel pan. Um, so if you ever see somebody playing a steel pan, do me a favor and don't hit it with your hands. <laughs> uh, we hate that. All right. Uh, I hope this helps you get a little bit of understanding of some of these notes that I've added. Um, you can also add your comments to the discussion forum or email me through Canvas. And I will see you soon. Yeah, 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 yeah.